Hey everybody, and welcome back to Detections with your hosts, Understudy77 and Exile the Trees. We're very excited to be back here with you this evening, um, or morning, probably, when most of you are listening to it, because I don't know how many people actually listen to this in the evening. Um, I think we're both a bit tired ourselves. Um, I was at something all week lovingly dubbed as BossCon 2020, um, which was basically a big leadership summit with my whole team. Um, it was great. We did trust falls and we held hands and we sing Kumbaya and that was fantastic. Um, really it was like we, we played arcade games and we went bowling and, um, we played board games and we drank and we did a lot of team building stuff and we, we did a lot of that and it was great. But how was your week, Exile? Uh, it was pretty busy. A mix of frustration and some technical work. That work frustration of people not responding back to you and then getting buried down to my ankles from my head and setting up a demo for a training that I've been building. Ah, See, I couldn't respond back to anybody because, like, the whole theme of the thing was be present, which meant no phones and no computers. Yeah, well... I had, like, two nine-hour workdays completely free of electronics devices for the most part. And that's definitely a viable thing, except if you know someone that can easily just pick up the phone and they're not in a situation like that. Right? <laughs> oh, no, trust me. We we tried our best. It doesn't mean that we didn't do anything that was technical, though. Uh, All right. I'm glad you had that time. You know I'm a big pusher in the Dead Pixel Sec community for people to put down their technology and get away for a little bit. Yeah, and it's for for a leadership team, especially a leadership team for a, a large organization. Like, it's really nice to meet and like get on the same page and and have the conversations and and all that stuff, right? Like, that's oh, yeah. really beneficial. Yeah, for sure. Um, anyway, enough about us. People don't actually listen to this because of us. <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah, uh, that, yeah, that that tracks. <laughs> um, so a couple of weeks ago, we had Andrew Thompson on to talk about uh, offset tools. It was Really fun. It was a really good time. Really cool episode. But, you know, we got all this detection swag in. I think we talked about that last week. And um, Mr. Thompson, I, I hit him up and I'm like, hey, man, by the way, like, do you like stickers and patches? Like, are those your thing? He goes, honestly, man, it'll just sit in a pile. He goes, I really appreciate it. But why don't you give it away? Like, on behalf of me, like, from me, why don't you take what you're going to give me and give it to somebody? So we ran a little contest, didn't we? Yeah, we ran a pretty cool contest. It was um, people putting out quotes that they liked from an episode. It was, and it was fun. Although I was very surprised that, you know, in Andrew's episode, um, people were quoting it all over Twitter, but, like, nobody used that quote, Mm -hmm. which that was amusing (laughs) to me, but also cool. Yeah. Um, So we have picked a winner. Um, after going through the list of quotes and list of thoughts and all the people who left us timestamps, which we also appreciated that level, that attention to detail for analysts. It's fantastic. Um, but who is that winner and what was their quote? So the quote was, we are backing, we are back continuing our quest to make blue team sexy because if you saw us, it wouldn't be possible. And that was brought out by Jennifer on Twitter. That might actually be the most true thing we ever said. <laughs> that's why we decided, because we're like, you pick the one thing that's funny and the most truth on any episode we've done. Well, congratulations, <laughs> Jennifer. Um, after this episode airs, we'll kind of we'll, we'll send out a tweet, too, um, and then we'll reach out so that we can get details so that we can ship you some stuff. Yes. And that will be fantastic. Excite! All right, cool. So, let's dive into it. ShmooCon is just a few short weeks away, so that's going to be a lot of fun. But, man, do we have a lot of news. Like, this was a busy week in cybersecurity. Yeah, for some reason, I guess people waited for just after the beginning of the calendar year to share some really interesting information. No, they waited till BossCon, (laughs) when all of us were busy doing other stuff. And they're like, managers are away, let's scare the analysts and incident responders and all the engineers with all of this crazy stuff. And clearly, these major things, like, revolve specifically around my organization. Yeah. But we do have some not-so-crazy and pretty cool things happening, like this first one. What's that? The Black Hills Information Security. Uh, It's an organization that I think most people have at least heard about. But they put out this free threat hunting course. Tomorrow's the first one. 
they capped at 5,000 people, and because of the response, they started a second one that will air in April. So I just want to give a shout out to them. Fantastic resource. Um, every So far, all the stuff that I've consumed from them has been quality material. Like Backdoors um, and Breaches. Like Backdoors and Breaches. Uh, all their webcasts, like even the ones they do about Elastic Stack and Sysmon and setting up detections and like going back and forth between red team, pen testing, defense detection. So uh, definitely want to make sure people understand like it's popular, people are looking for it, and don't fret, they set up another one. And you should sign up before it's full because it'll probably fill again. And it's it's kind of cool that they're doing a free six-hour course. They release a lot of good information. They have a good podcast. Like, yep. you know, we're obviously supporters of podcasts. <laughs> yeah, uh, I checked it out. Like, the announcement, when they made the announcement that it was going to be on the 6th uh, on Twitter, they already had 200 people signed up. And, like, it only been minutes out there. So definitely I mean, it was like it. trying to get a copy of Backdoors and Breaches at DerbyCon. Where I didn't actually get one from them. I had to beat up my friend and take his. Yes, yeah, so you know, everyone was lucky and happened to get in that class from John Strand and got first edition, first print, cards are still warm. So I did get one of those. I just had to beat somebody up for it. <laughs> did you I didn't the- really do that. He, he freely gave it to me because he knows I'm super into board games. And I'm going to shout out my friend Jelly for that because he's awesome and he gave it to me. Nice. Did you get the D20 with it, though? I did. Nice. But I have several of the Black Hills D20s from other events. Yeah. White one, blue number is lettering. That's the only one that matters. No, I got the the orange one. Oh, the third hunting one? one? Nice. Yeah. All right. So what else Next is thing. going on this week? So this was kind of like a, an interesting piece of news. I saw that Mozilla laid off 70 people like... Very recently, may have been today or yesterday. Uh, but I wanted to bring the article up because they lay out some reasons why on how, as a company, Mozilla wanted to, the, the, the parent company of Mozilla, not the, not the smaller, um, like <clears throat> the smaller code writing version, but the, the more corporate one. Uh, they wanted to live within their means and they didn't have enough revenue coming in. So they had to lay people off to live within their means. Uh, but they're focusing on generating uh, programs that are subscription-based revenue generation, like a Mozilla VPN. It's so, it's really hard, admittedly, to be like, because, you know, you look at the browser game, right? And browsers yeah. are free. You've got your primary OS browsers. You've got Chrome. You've got Firefox. And you've got, like, Brave and stuff, which are much smaller. But, like, you look at the direction that Firefox has gone, and they've gone very privacy-centric. Yes. So, essentially, in a lot of ways, like the opposite of Google. Um, although Google's starting to get there too, but like Google makes their money off knowing you. Like, I guess they just care less if nobody else knows you, but them, um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it was just that one. So like, it, it's semi difficult to, to make good money in that because like Mozilla is not necessarily advertiser friendly. No. And, and as a company, they've, gen- they've been very supportive of the, the FOSS, the free and open source software, mm-hmm. and they do a lot of work in helping maintain that code. So yeah, it is a delicate balance. So uh, it is something to pay attention to because they they are saying that they're working and putting development money into subscription based services, and with things like the freely available Firefox Send, which uses their their encryption for one time download or multi time download um, encrypted things for secure transfer of files. Like they're not asking money for that. Um, which means whatever subscription stuff they do come out, it's likely to keep the same privacy-focused uh, behavior that they've already proven. <clears throat> but speaking well, of Google... One of the, they, well, before we go to Google, one of the things that's really interesting is, you know, Mozilla started with Netscape, right? Yes, um, and all of the Firefox code at its core is still that Netscape code. It is, and when you go way back into that, that all links back to, like, AOL. Mm-hmm. Which... I work for. <laughs> we we have we have you remember the original giant Mozilla dinosaur? Or yes. The original Mozilla dinosaur. Mm-hmm. We have a we have a giant di- Mozilla dinosaur statue in our office. I'm jealous. If I ever make it over to your side of the country, I'll take you to see the giant I need dinosaur. It. Like this needs to happen. I'll take you to see it. <clears throat> anyway, yeah. So Google that does take us into Google. Google and specifically Chrome, the browser software. Uh, we got a couple here. I'll start with mine. Uh, that they're changing the way that they do this uh, 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 
checking of extensions of things that come through the browser, where previously it was only select ones. And now it's changing to, it's going to uh, do this scan and this uh, security check on all things with an extension going through the browser, except things on a whitelist. Huh. So the article kind of goes into that, but they also start to discuss like, what's the potential privacy impact of Google, who you just made a very, very astute observation about how they see individuals using their browser. Uh, scanning every file that's going through the browser. Right. But they continue to do some other interesting stuff, too. Um, for instance, they are going to phase out user agent strings here soon. Um, they're going to move to a new technology called Client Hints, part of the newer Privacy Sandbox project, and phase out user agent strings. And that gets really interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, from a privacy perspective, I get it, but like, there's a lot of like detection baseline in, especially like IDS and stuff, right? Yeah, pretty that much is, anything signature based that deals with the network that involves user agents. A lot agents. of it is yeah. based off user agent strings. So as Chrome phases out user agent strings, I would encourage anybody who listens to think about what that might do to some of your network based detections and network visibility. Um, I'm not going to say it's a good or a bad thing. I'm just think about the impact that yeah. it might have on you from a security perspective. And then when you're ready to dig in more, like look at the client hint thing. Cause when I was reading this article, like it's still a way to pull information about people using the browser because they don't want to give up their advertising money while still trying to like play this privacy balance game. I mean, of course they don't want to give up their advertising money. That's, that's their whole company. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so definitely, like, read the article, think about it, talk about it in your circles, because um, it's going to happen. Oh, yeah. So should we move to the first big piece of shit that I, happened? I, I think this bur this first big piece of shit is ready to be discussed. All right. So about January 10th, um, there was some interesting stuff going on. Scanning activity from a host in Germany targeting Citrix um, application delivery controller and the Citrix gateway, so the net scalers. Um, the vulnerability that they're attempting to hit allows unauthenticated remote attackers to execute commands on a server after chaining an arbitrary file read write directory traversal flaw. So I'm not going to read into this, but we're talking about like code execution. So like that's bad. And it's not hard to do it. Um, and where it gets even more interesting, and we'll you know we'll drop the drop the general link for it. But Exile, aren't they actively like misusing this? Like, aren't attackers right now actively misusing this? Yeah, it it is technically a misuse, but it's kind of a entertaining misuse at the same time. Because um, there is a I I forget the 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 like campaign name for it right now as we're talking but there is a there is a person out there who is deploying a mitigation for this vulnerability while maintaining their own backdoor it's no trobin no trobin that's what it is <laughs> but like they're being helpful they're patching the vulnerability and making sure that they're the only person that has a backdoor right now this is not a new behavior though it's, it's been not. a it's not. It's it's one of those ones that's been around for a while where people, hackers, criminals, cyber criminals will patch a system after they set up their back door to ensure that they're the only ones that have access to that. Mm -hmm. And there's a there's a really good fire eye report about this, right? But you know, they do believe that the actor is probably quietly collecting this stuff for a subsequent campaign. So to use this stuff in a campaign later. Mm-hmm. Uh, which also follows behavior of how like uh, a lot of phishing campaigns get tar uh, started too. Is you'll see an initial test, uh, an initial buildup of infrastructure, and then it will sit quietly for months or years for a future campaign. Yep. So, how do you know if this is a problem? Well, first you have to have like Netscalers, but secondly, Nick Carr, also from Fire, they're getting a lot of love tonight. Um, <laughs> kind of grabbed a, a one-liner for this, um, and I'll, I'll read it. Grep-I. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to read it. Um, <laughs> we will link Psych. it, though. It's, it's the shortest possible indication of successful exploitation for the ADC and Netscalers. 
Um, it's been used on active XRs, it'll or active active IRs. It'll capture some some of the variations that have happened. Um, so like if you're looking for this, you you can look through your your log and and find this. So we will share that. So like for the first time ever, you get a detection in like at like the beginning of the episode. Hi, Croft. Hi. So that's <clears throat> super cool. Hi, cat. <laughs> yes. He came up and started scratching on my leg to get my attention. Yeah. <clears throat> so, but on the, the technical side, I just have a quick thing that I want to throw out there for people. So I was reading this um, this blog post that was put up uh, from a uh, redteam.pl website where it talks about deceiving blue teams with some anti-forensic behavior uh, to basically do uh, attacker-based honeypot on defenders and researchers. Now, I know we're generally defense-focused, but I bring this up because the blog post has a pretty good technical breakdown so that you can understand the behavior to know how to not fall for the trap. <clears throat> While it's not explicitly stated, like, don't do this, there's enough technical understanding in that that you can be like, oh, this behavior, I change this one thing, and I don't fall for the trap. But... It kind of goes back to a thing that we've discussed before with reaching out direct. So uh, you got something coming in that you want to reach out to a remote server to see if there's like any malware code on there. Gets back to that whole, uh, is this a targeted campaign? Right? Which means yeah, sure. you get one chance. You can do something like this to try to bypass the honeypot and it may work or it still may trigger something. So just something to be aware of. Read it. Look at it. And we're going to talk about deceptive blue teaming in a couple weeks. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, that's going to be fun. Um, so if we move on. So this one's really interesting. Um, and this is kind of one of those things that, like, you know, we're starting to see a very interesting pivot where, like, computers aren't necessarily the most valuable asset anymore, right? Like, there's a lot of work being done in IoT, but there's also smartphones and there's not a lot that takes place on smartphones so this is gets really interesting when malware comes pre-installed on your phone and you can't do anything about it um so there's a company a smartphone model called unimax which is an android-based smartphone that's made in china sold by assurance wireless um they sell cell phones as part of lifeline which is a government program that subsidizes phone service for low-income americans so like one, two, three, punch. Like, this is this is pretty bad in general, right? Like, this is definitely exploitation. So there were a whole bunch of things that happened. So Malwarebytes kind of dug into it a little bit. Um, they found that one of the components, an app named Wireless Update, contained the Adupes malware, which is essentially a backdoor. Um, it was discovered back in 2017. It's a malicious firmware component created by a Chinese company of the same name. It provides... Uh, over-the-air system update to various smartphone makers and basically lets you do a whole bunch of other bad stuff. They also, while they were looking through this, found a dropper that leads to adware called Hidden Ads. Um, they haven't been able to get Hidden Ads to drop, but they found a strain of heavily obfuscated malware believed to be of Chinese origin due to heavy use of Chinese characters as variable names that leads to Hidden Ads. So here's the killer. It's unremovable. Unless you don't want to update your phone. So for the Adupes backdoor, um, if you kill wireless update, you also kill the ability to over the air update your phone, which kills the ability to update your phone. And the hidden ads thing is part of the settings app in this phone. Um, you can't physically remove settings in a phone. Um, now, Assurance Wireless did kind of make a statement to ZDNet about this. They said they're aware of the issue. They're in touch with the manufacturer. However, they don't believe the applications described in the media are malware. So we'll see where that goes, but that's really interesting. It's and not, I mean, go ahead. interesting to follow. It's going to be really interesting to follow because, you know, we, we've talked about Toe Talk twice now. And now we're talking about like other malware, like that's not even like you're installing, right? Like it's coming on your phone. So. It's going to be interesting. It, all the speculation about Hawaii and all that stuff, too. Genuinely very interesting. You know another topic that we've talked about a lot? <laughs> this concept of, of medical device stuff. 
Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, like, which one? Because we have a lot of things on that we list. We have. Um, so I read an article, and I'm, I'm not going to really talk through this because I think we have a more relevant topic when it comes to the medical stuff. But there's, there's an article, and it will be posted with the show, for the journey to better medical device security. It's still slow, and it's still bumpy. And it's basically just talking about how insecure um, and, and how – Cybersecurity and healthcare is in critical condition. Like it's bad, and it is. And these are things that you know people live off of, that we've seen exploited from different things. And um, I believe you have some stuff to talk like real impact wise, like something really interesting, right? I do, um, and it piggies back on a couple of things that we've discussed. We've discussed ransomware. We've discussed medical industry. And then we mentioned an article before about how there was a, a a medical facility that got hit by ransomware, but there wasn't any like known impact to uh, personal health safety at that point. Well, there was one recently in California where this medical center was actually forced to reschedule procedures that was happening in the medical center because of a ransomware attack. Wow. Okay. Now, it's a medical center, so it wasn't necessarily, I mean, probably isn't anything life-threatening, but if it's already impacting actual medical procedures, it's just a beginning indicator of what happens when this hits a hospital. Yeah, I hate to say it, but we're, we're kind of talking about a matter of time, I mm-hmm. think, in a lot of ways on this one. Yep, because uh, uh, proof of concept working on a medical center is just another one of those things. Hey, we've proven this can work. Now let's go for a bigger target like a hospital. Right. So that'll be interesting to follow. And I'm sure throughout the year we're going to hear more about like medical centers getting hit um, from ransomware groups and financial organizations, as well as potentially some, you know, non just financially motivated attackers. There's a lot of sensitive data that exists in hospitals and there's a lot of damage that you can do. Um, Speaking of damage. So, and you know it's bad because I'm I'm referencing an NSA advisory for this one. Um, so a cryptographic vulnerability in Windows came up for both clients and servers. The CVE number for anybody interested is twenty twenty zero six zero one. It affects Windows cryptographic functionality. Basically, it allows an attacker to undermine how Windows verifies cryptographic trust and enable remote code execution. So RC is pretty bad. Um, essentially, if if I understand this correctly, by going to a website, um, because they can basically screw with the website certificate and screw with this function and then execute remote code um, on your computer. So you know how we talked about like clicking links is usually not that bad until it is way, way back when. And now this it is, is kind of one of those situations. <laughs> So validation of trust impact can include HTTPS connections, signed files and emails, signed executable code launched as user mode process. And at the end for our detection portion, we're actually going to discuss, like, because this is such a pretty big thing, um, at least one way that you can use to detect this. But um, there was a researcher, I saw this, and um, now that I think about it, we can put the link in here too, just as a quick reference. But there was someone who actively showed it in the wild, the effect that it had. Mm-hmm. When they redirected NSA.gov and GitHub.com to Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up. Nice. <laughs> Ultimately, <laughs> what we're looking at is something that to mitigate, you must patch. The patch is out. Um, it does exist, so you can patch. And But the consequences are severe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The exploitation tools are going to be made quickly and probably wild, widely available. I would not be surprised, and bear in mind this airs on Sunday, but I would not be surprised based on this is being released now if we don't see serious patching happen over the weekend. So all the people who are working this weekend, um, you have you have my heart. We, it's going to be a shit weekend for you. We salute you for those who are out there patching this right now. I'm going to take a moment... And we're, we're going to have a moment of silence for those warriors who are fixing this problem so that they don't get exploited and continue to protect people in their company. Okay, moment of silence. <laughs> they deserve a longer one, but like that's, that would be really awkward if you just spent like a minute without hearing anything. But at the same time, like that was over a full second, which 
considering most people who work in IT and patch deal in microseconds, that was a pretty big moment. <laughs> that, that's very true. <laughs> um, okay. So that kind of brings us into our topic for the evening. And we, we kind of talked back and forth about this a little bit. And we decided that instead of going like strictly defense or technical, um, we were going to talk about something both of us actually talk about quite a bit um, in other locales. We're going to talk about interviewing because interviewing is such a major topic and we'll probably do one on resumes at another time. But like the whole concept of like how to interview well or what to expect going into an interview for a defense position, like it's such an interesting topic. And I do have to leave a disclaimer. Everybody interviews differently. So like some of the opinions that myself and Exile will share tonight will be how we feel about interviewing and what that looks like and things of that nature not necessarily how everybody else is going to interview you so don't take us as the one source of truth and don't expect that like just because i say i think something is stupid that other people the majority of them won't still do it is that fair i think that's fair that's very fair all right so where do we want to start with this <clears throat> well i I mean, we do have a couple of places we could talk about the initial anxiety, um, self-perception, but I think we should just go back to um, the initial presentation. Okay. That first meeting, right? The initial handshake, the hi, the hello. Okay. Well, what about the, the phone screen that comes before that? Oh, yeah. Phone screens. That happens. Right. So as, as an example of comparison... Um, what we generally do, the phone screen is mostly just the, are you available for an in-person interview? And we have a long uh, partial technical interview. So our phone screens are pretty much non-existent because we prefer face-to-face. -face. Oh, I do serious phone screens. Um, primarily because I do hundreds of them and I deal with a lot of candidates. So I actually put a lot of weight into phone screens. And the difference for you is you have a remote team where generally the, 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 all the hiring I've done is for a federal contract on site only. Oh, so I, you're right. I have a semi remote team. Um, and, but we do do in person interviews. That's the final say. But mm -hmm. I try not to waste my in person people's time. So, and I don't genuinely trust resumes. Like if your resume seems okay, I'll probably talk to you on the phone. And then I'll make a determination as to whether or not I think you're worth bringing in. I shouldn't say worth. You're all worth a lot. Um, then I'll make a determination as to whether or not you know I'm going to bring somebody in for my team to but, see if they'd be a good fit. But it's a business decision. What you were trying to get at is not that the individual people are not worth as a person, but it's a comparison of the presentation of the individual to the business needs. Correct. Do you fill my gaps or do you have some of the qualities that I look for? So maybe that's an interesting place to start. Qualities. Yeah. Qualities get really interesting. So, like, what qualities do you look for when you talk to a candidate? Like, what matters to you most? Like, your top three. All right. So, top three. Uh, one is definitely the puzzler detective mindset. Uh, people who like to figure out the puzzle, who like the investigation. Um, the number two are people who... Uh, we accept social awkwardness because um, generally in the industry, there are people with a, a general higher academic intelligence, which comes with a bit of social awkwardness. You're, you're always going to have social awkwardness. Yeah. It's just part of it. <laughs> uh, but people who work and work within and ha at least have enough self-understanding that um, they're not completely abrasive with everyone that they talk to. Right. So a little bit of humility in there. Uh, and the third one is at least enough technical understanding to speak the language. Okay. Elaborate on that a little bit. I'm interested. <clears throat> so uh, part of the technical thing we do is there's logs and we walk them through. So uh, understanding like DNS means domain name service. We don't expect people to regurgitate every single record type because that's a reference and as a SOC analyst you're going to be using Google a lot to look stuff up um, but at least a lot of the general generally accepted industry terms between information technology and information security okay uh, uh, 
less than that then kind of goes into an intern uh, program, right? To teach them up from nothing to at least having a base understanding. Um, that's kind of just like a technical line that's drawn because of the the quick retar- required turnaround for that specific contract of needing to get up to speed for the specific tool set. And then because of the federal site, uh, adjusting to the politics. Sure. So the ability to do that. Yeah. So you talk about the detective thing. I usually boil that down to the concept of curiosity. Mm-hmm. Um, curiosity is usually my number one. Um, one of the first things that I look for, and I look for that in a couple different ways. Um, one of them, and this happens way less than you would think. If you don't know the answer to the question, ask. Nobody ever asks. Nobody goes, I'm not sure, but I'm really interested to know. Like, that's, that's what I want. I, I just want somebody to be like, I'm not sure, but like, could you elaborate? Could you tell me? Could you give it to me? So I take away knowledge from this. Like, so there's a tip for you a little early. <laughs> Uh, ask the question we've even had people ask can i use my phone to look up something that i'm not quite sure about um the other one that i look for and the reason why i asked you to elaborate on some of the some of the stuff like common industry terms is i look less for terms than i do concepts so like conceptually can you work your way through this problem that i'm going to give you um i don't give two fucks most of the time if you know you know, this term or that term or that port number or that port number. Can can you reasonably talk through this scenario with me and how you would act? Mm-hmm. Um, and lastly, really, this this concept of, like, critical thinking under pressure. And I do try to make interviews, like, as, as little pressure as possible. Um, because I, I don't actually think you get somebody's best when you have them fucking nervous and concerned all the time. And, I again, this is where we get to the... Some of the stuff we're going to say is not necessarily going to be the the status quo, right? Correct. Um, but I don't think people perform their best when they're nervous. So I try to make people relatively comfortable and have a conversation, um, usually about concepts. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm usually the one when I'm involved in interviews that's when I see someone getting nervous, kind of toning down it, pulling it back into a conversation. Um yeah, so totally, like, I've seen it. I, I wouldn't just say, like, potentially or possibly. Like, it's proven people interview, like, crap when they're completely nervous. I've been in that situation myself. And they're usually completely nervous. Yeah. Um, so the for people who are on the interviewer side, just keep it in mind. Like, be conversational, and you're probably going to get more of the answers of what you're looking for to help you make a decision than applying that pressure. Mm-hmm. So, question for you. Yes. Where do you stand on Port Bingo? I cannot fucking stand it. Me either. <laughs> um, I actually go into interviews with a printed out sheet of ports in my little binder thing. Um, and then if somebody goes, we're going to play some Port Bingo, I'm going to be like, well, I brought this sheet. Can I pull it out? And for the most part, everybody always says no. But I go, do I get bonus points for coming prepared? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and personally, if somebody comes prepared with something like, I'm not good at memorization, I know that. So I prepare myself and I use tools to help me with that where I can quickly reference. Um, if you do things like that, like it's totally viable to to show that skill set in an interview. Maybe it'll work for some people. Maybe it won't work for others. I couldn't tell you. But I do think it's viable to show that. A- absolutely. Uh, the big reason why I don't like it is once you start actually investigating the traffic, Knowing what typically works on a port means shit. So an example question that I ask people to kind of gauge the mentality of like a traditional like network engineer versus an analyst is if you look at logs and you see UDP and TCP traffic on port 53, what does that mean? So I realize it's kind of a gotcha, but most see DNS, which is typically true, but in the technical aspects of it, what it all that really means is you don't know until you look at the traffic because it's dependent on what's listening and what's sending on that specific port communication. Yeah, because you can also like XFIL via DNS. Yeah, or you can set up like a completely custom server that does HTTP over port 53. Um, mm-hmm. And if that remote system only listens for HTTP traffic, HTTP traffic on port 53, that's all it's going to accept. And you don't know that that's actual traffic until you see it. So that's kind of like a gauge that I use and why I don't like port bingo, because ports can be used for anything. (laughs) I do not believe, personally, that memorization 
is a sign of a good anything. It's just my my personal stance on this. Um, you know, I have had people who have aced memorization based interviews and and not been able to function in the real world. So I tend to ask much more um, global and much more thought provoking questions. And I'm going to blow up my spot here because I'm going to share one of my favorite ones. So if anybody in the future ever <laughs> interviews with me, um, you got a heads up if you listen to this. Um, if you could have one piece of visibility, what would it be? And how would you use it to find badness? That's a really good question. There's a lot of thought that has to go into that because I do genuinely expect my analysts, even my new ones, because I, I challenge them into this thought process. What don't we see right now? What don't we have today? And how do we kind of clear that up? Like, what do we need to get that? That, to me, is a core function of an analyst. Yeah, and it invokes the creative aspect of the brain and also lets you kind of see where their technical background is, not as a yes or no, but as a where do you place them technically in your team. Yep, exactly. And what does this look like to you? So, like, you know, everybody's going to have different layers of importance. Some people are going to say, like, full packet capture. Some people are going to say, like, command line. So... There's a whole lot of different ways to answer that question, and none of them are necessarily wrong, but it kind of lets me know where your focus is. As long as you have a reason behind it. Like, if you just say one thing and, like, that's just the way it is, right, then that also shows an attitude. Yep. I also ask why, though. Um, and I tend to do cascading interviews like that. So I'll ask one question, and then I'll be like, okay, elaborate on that. Okay, dig deeper here. Okay, dig deeper there. Okay, dig deeper there. And I tend to cascade down, trying to get to a point where they don't have an answer. So one thing to remember as you're doing interviews, because it's not an uncommon strategy, that cascading thing. It's not a particularly uncommon strategy. Mm -hmm. So one thing to keep in mind is people are going to dig until you don't know the answer. It's okay to not know stuff. Nobody expects you to know everything. Very few people expect you to know everything. Yeah, especially in this information cybersecurity. Hey, how many industry? bits are in a byte? <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Somebody's going to laugh at that. And it's like three people that will laugh at that, but it's worth it. Two nibbles, I think, is the correct answer. Correct. <laughs> anyway, uh, continue. No, and I was going to say, too, on the same note, like um, another question that we asked that plays into the log source is, and I hear this commonly more and more now from other people who've interviewed with different companies, is what are you doing? outside of official education to stay up to date on news and grow your own knowledge. So like what sort of lab are you running? What are you doing on your personal computer? What things are you pursuing in your own time? So I ask questions like that too, but I do find them to be really interesting. And this is a cool outlet to have this conversation. Um, I believe very strongly in work-life balance. Yes. I'm an obsessive person. So like, I spend my time doing shit like this and playing academic advisor and reading papers and all that shit, right? Um, I don't expect that of everybody. So I love that question. And I love that question for a couple of reasons, especially for people who are a little bit thinner on the work experience perspective. Mm -hmm. But I also try to not judge that question too heavily or give it too much of a weight because like, I don't know that I think people have to be all in in this and that they can't like they have to go home and do all this stuff. Does that make sense? Like it's, it's not that it's not important, but at the same time, I don't necessarily want to build a, a team that is so overly obsessive in this, that like the expectation is that they spend all their time. Exactly. This. And that's what I like about the community about that question too, is it shows where the individual is on that obsessive scale. That's true. If and I mean, if, if somebody's happily there, like I have employees who are all in like that and they're great employees. Um, I, I, I <clears throat> genuinely split people into two camps. Um, and you know, we label stuff as, as humans. It's just what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, rocks and waves. The guys who are all in are the waves. Like I'll have them for a little while, one, two, maybe three years, then they'll go. Um, the rocks I'll have much longer. They're not the ones who are doing this at home, but they make the backbone. Like, they are equally important. Yeah, and um, the ones who are like you're calling the waves, uh, their passion comes out quite quickly once you ask that question. Oh, yeah, it does. Um, 
And it gets really interesting, though, when people talk about it. Like, they list a couple news sources, and I've had a couple of these, and I go, oh, well, tell me about an article that you've read recently. And they go, uh, oh, oh. So, hey, like, if anybody's interviewing soon, we have really cool articles, like, every week that cover <laughs> yep. cybersecurity topics that you can use in your interviews. Especially, <clears throat> like, this week with the Windows vulnerability and the Citrix vulnerability. Like, those are cool things to talk about and be like, hey, I learned this thing. Uh, yes, and um, that kind of reminds me of another. Qu- here's a here's a tip uh, that could end up also in an interview. Uh, we will ask a question. Pick a piece of ransomware, malware, something like that that's been in the news recently, and uh, if if they've read, like if there's someone who said they read articles, and then explain how that works. Then Ooh, that's a good one. Right? Because then you get like the same kind of like technical questioning. It's a conversational thing back and forth, and you can do the cascading. And if they get nervous, then you can be like, okay, hold up. Let's just go back to the beginning. What's the name? What are the basics of it? And then break it down from there. So here's two other very related points um, and pieces of advice. First off, if it's on your resume, it's fair game. I will read your resume. And I will quiz you. If your resume says malware analysis, I will ask you malware analysis questions. If your resume says digital forensics, I will ask you forensics questions. If it says bro or IDS, I will ask you those questions. If it's on your resume, be able to speak to it at least a bit. That's really important because if not, I've interviewed a lot of people who are like malware analysis. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, and you know, bear in mind, they're, I, I teach an introduction to malware analysis class, right? So I'm like, cool. So like, talk to me about like your process. You get a malicious file. What do you do? And then like, walk me through that whole process. How do you analyze it? What do you do? How do you scope it? Like, let's, let's talk about all this stuff. Um, the other one that kind of falls in line with this. And I lost my thought. So talk. while you're thinking, I'll, I'll jump in here and say, uh, to piggyback on that, uh, generally speaking, uh, as someone who's also tried to do this in the past, you're not a, uh, the what may seem as clever on the resume. There will at least be one person in the interview who will catch that cleverness and call you on it through asking direct questions like that. Oh God, yeah, <laughs> I love asking direct questions yeah. based off resumes. Yeah, so it's like uh. you put you put a word on there just to get past an HR filter. There will inevitably be one person who'll be like, oh. This kind of sounds like BS. So I'm going to ask some questions on this to see how much BS is behind it. Yep. Oh, I remember now. Interviews are about you. So one of the things that I see a lot is I go, you know, so what did you do in this situation? And they go, well, my team. No, no, no. Not your team. I don't don't care. I'm not hiring your team. I'm not hiring the company that you work for. I'm hiring you. Tell me what you specifically did. So... Try to bear in mind and try to keep in mind that uh, what you do, it's about what you did, not about what the group that you were with did. Um, that's really important and something that a lot of people struggle with. And I'll be say right now, I'm one of those because I don't like talking about myself. It's kind of a mix of the imposter syndrome and some of the way that I was raised that still has some long-term self-doubt stuff that I deal with. Um but it is, like you're saying, it is an important thing to get over. And most interviewers will recognize that and are aware of it, and they really won't embarrass you about it. But definitely take the time to practice some things. You don't have to go into like a boasting, in-depth aspect of it. Um, it can just be bullet points. Correct. And I don't embarrass people with it, but I do say, please stop. I need to know what you did. I don't really say please stop, but I'm like, yeah, not your team, you. Like, it's got to be in that tense. Yeah. Um, Any other points that you have off the top of your head? I have one other really, really important one, but I want to see what else we got. Well, the the last one for me as an interviewer is I want to see your individual character and personality, right? Like, I don't want to hire robots. I don't want to work with robots, Um, which is why sometimes... You have a problem with robots. (laughs) What's so bad about them? I Um, have feelings too, man. Yeah. Bite my shiny metal ass. Well... Bender has very specific feelings. <laughs> um, and alcohol problems. <laughs> big alcohol problems. Um, but 
we're human, right? Like it's okay to show what you're human. And if there is a thing in your life that can relate to the job, um, it still shows passion. And a lot of that stuff is actually cross relatable. Uh, for instance, uh, a question that I will ask when I see people getting nervous, but help them just get back in line with the interview is what sort of games are you interested in playing? Cause yeah, in, we've talked about the board game question a lot. Yeah. Uh, it gives an insight into their mentality, right? How they think, how they pursue, how they problem solve. But then on their side, it's a thing that they enjoy or don't enjoy that then helps to deflate some of that nervousness. And then you can get back into some of the other stuff in the interview. Yep. So here's my, my big thing and my, this is probably one of the most important things to me. And this is to the interviewer less than the interviewee. Remember something you were there having that conversation or seven of them. It really depends on where you are in the process because you were seen to have value. That's important to know. But what's also important to know is that as much as that company is checking you out and seeing if you are a fit, you are seeing if you are a fit. That's really important. Ask hard questions. Understand what you're getting involved in. Fully vet the same way they fully vet. Like I tend to leave a lot of time for questions because I expect people to vet me and my team and whatever, because I think that's really important. Like, and you can ask hard questions, not just like, what does a day in the life look like? But I tend to ask like to, you know, the hiring manager who's interviewing me, what, uh, what's your management style? And then I might go to any of his direct reports that also interview me like my peers who would be my peers and be like, so how's the manager? Like, what's his style? Like, what does he expect? Like, how does he like to be talked to? Like, cause most people quit jobs over their manager, not over the job. Like, that's just the way it works. So I ask questions like that. I ask questions about growth. I ask all kinds of questions to make sure that it's a fit for me. And I know as, as much as most of us have imposter syndrome in a bad way, try to remember that you are there because you have value and value is seen in you and you are allowed to ask hard questions. Absolutely. And, um, a way that I help to deal with some of the like imposter syndrome stuff is to remember that this is a two way effectively business arrangement. You're signing a contract with a company to provide a service. It is very much within your rights to expect something in return on that business contract. Correct. Because they need you just as much as you need them. Yep. And for the love of God, please research the company. <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, just a real quick note on that. When you're looking at Glassdoor reviews and stuff like that, the company, um, just as a little trick that I learned, pay attention to the regional areas too for uh, national companies. Mm, yeah. Because that usually is an indicator of management in a regional area, and the company may be good in a different region despite uh, uh, aggregated review. Also true. So, with that said, and I mean, we could, I'm not going to lie, we could delve into this way longer. Yes. Like, we might even have to do a follow-up on this one and just do more <laughs> for this. Um, maybe, like, interview each other back and forth. That could be fun. Um, but, but we did we did promise everyone something. We did promise everyone something. And it's a first for us. Maybe because we were busy. It's our first outsourced detection. I mean, but yes. It's not from India. It, it is What's outsourced, not from India. But coming from Zeke, it's generally a pretty reliable source. It's, it's a pretty reliable source. And, I mean, it's worth it to say, like, we are not the sole experts of this. So, like... If we can point you to wonderful resources that the community has built that will help you find badness, that's what we're here for. Yes. Not just to come up with them ourselves. Yes. Because, I mean, we take them from these places, too. <laughs> I mean, uh, a lot of the stuff that I've talked about from the detections um, that I've shared previously is from reading an article somewhere else and then putting it into practice. Me, too. So, we talked a lot about CVE-0601, uh, 2020-0601, which is that Windows vulnerability. Yeah, the crypto API, crypto aspect. Yep. yep. So how can we detect it, Exile? 
<clears throat> so the Zeek article that we will share uh, breaks it down pretty easily. So the the technical basis of the certificate it uses an elliptical curve certificate for how, how it handles the crypto aspect of it. And what they did for this detection to um, show this vulnerability is they're looking for any certificate that's not using a NIST or known published uh, elliptical curve uh, crypto. Now, okay. that gets into something we've discussed many times about detections on is how it's labeled really what's actually detecting. Right? So like this one, right. for instance, is saying it's detecting this vulnerability where if you look at the actual uh, breakdown of it, it's looking for things that are not standard. It isn't necessarily an indicator of the vulnerability every single time, just that something's not standard. So it's just something to keep in mind with a detection like this, that the description may not perfectly explain the behavior. So be sure to check both. Agreed. But if you're in a situation where this is something that impacts your organization, you need a quick way to figure out what might or how it might impact your organization or see something. Um, this can often be one of those things that we call like the emergency push until we have something else sometimes. Correct. Um, hey, I've got bro. I've got Zeke. Um, I've got this thing. We're patching right now. And like, I have to do this. Like I built one of these for Heartbleed many many years ago like a <laughs> stopgap right for my clients when i was doing engineering work like maybe this is more than a stopgap for your environment maybe it's not but sometimes you just have to turn something on and deal with it because the shit is that important and in this case i, I think the shit is it, that important i mean considering the nsa was the one that worked with microsoft to make it available and to say this is important like whatever people's individual feelings are about the nsa the fact or that microsoft. a federal agency took the time to work with a vendor on it it's pretty important yeah that's a lot yes. of resources put behind that which is why we're totally crowdsourcing this to something else because <laughs> like this is a really important one to be able yeah. to detect right now yes um and I, I am not in an environment where I can see the, the signal to noise ratio, the false positives on this. Um, but in the rest of the Zeke article, they do bring up a question about um, what happens specifically in a situation when the certificate contains the standard curve, but encodes the parameters explicitly. Now, that sounds pretty technical in the article. They have a breakdown to dig into it more, but basically what it's saying is, um, what happens if it's a situation where it falls within certain parameters, but explicitly states that to bypass and still do the man in the middle, right? So avoid the normal mm -hmm. detection. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what they're saying with this is that uh, even though those parameters are very highly unusual, uh, they believe the false positives are very low because it is such a fringe case with these elliptical curve certificates, these ECC certificates. Yep, and I can't speak for the validity of that statement at all, um, but it's it's worth being aware of. Yes, and for those that use Zeek or OpenSSL, like there are known packages of OpenSSL where this comes a problem. Um, those users of Zeek, they already have uh, an upgraded package that deals with this issue to, to minim minimize even that. Um, but if you use something else... Uh, just be aware that when you write the certificate check, like there is this one individual case that may cause a false positive. It's saying that it's a pretty low thing and easy to deal with, but vet it through your environment first because as we've all learned, each organization, organization is a very unique vary. snowflake. Oh, yeah. Every organization may vary. Yeah. Well, I think with that, that's our show, right? Uh, it sure looks like it. it I, I kind of want to keep talking, but we're done. We are. Do you want to take us take us out? Yes, I will. Thank you for joining us, and remember to go forth and find badness.